Well, that was a fantastic panel, and what a way to end it on a very high note. Um, this will be our second panel this morning. After this panel, we will be having lunch. And also, I'd like to re recommend, if you did have a question that wasn't answered, you're more than welcome to speak with the panelists on either panel during lunch today. So um, again, I'm Susan Poole. I work with uh, Consensus and the EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum. I'll be moderating this panel as well. And um, first, I'll ask the panelists, please introduce yourself with your name and the organization that you work with. And we'll start down at the end. All right. My name is Nina Siedler. I'm partner with DWF, a global law firm, um, and as well active in the German Bundesblock, um, the German Blockchain Association. And we just formed um, a legal think tank in Luxembourg with 44 colleagues um, to look deeper, especially into the regulatory and um, legal questions. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, Robert Herrian from the Open University. Um, I work with Open Blockchain, which is a, a group at the Open University, also involved in my colleagues in the Knowledge and Media Institute, KMI, who I believe some of you may have met previously. They've worked on, on I think, the last project uh, that the, um, this, this particular forum did. I'm new to it, uh, so it's, it's lovely to meet you all, and uh, I look forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Michelle Fink. I'm a senior researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition. Um, and I do research on blockchain and other, a bunch of other topics related to data and the data economy. Hello, everybody. My name is Benedict Schuple. I'm a Swiss lawyer. I used to work as chief legal officer for a Swiss blockchain exchange. And now I'm co-founder of Lexon, um, a company creating legal smart contracts and everything that it involves. Um, I did some research prior to that on uh, smart contracts, and um, I'm also a foundational foundation counsel of the Lewis Foundation. Uh, hi, I'm Florian Filippi. I'm a researcher at the CNRS in Paris and um, a faculty associate at the Batman Center at Harvard University. And um, most of my research is uh, on analyzing the legal and governance. Uh, aspect of blockchain technologies, and um, I'm also the co-founder and director of Koala, uh, which is a non-profit organization that gathers uh, academics, lawyers, and engineers, and a little bit of everyone, uh, to collaboratively brainstorm and work together in order to identify practical solutions to existing legal issues related to blockchain. Thank you. Um, for this panel, for this panel, I won't be directing specific questions to specific people. So I'll be asking the question to the panel, and if you're interested in responding, just signal. And uh, and we'll, we won't be able to have every person answer every question. Um, there is a total of six questions, and so feel free to to answer when you when it's important for you to um, provide your insights. So for this panel, um, what we're going to be speaking about, blockchain triggers paradigm shifts that make it challenging for developers and entrepreneurs to approach the new legal effects. Many questions arise regarding the legal recognition and the implication of smart contracts. So for our first question, panelists, currently, what regulations apply to the creation and transfer of digital assets on a blockchain? And in your view, do these regulations cover everything? And I'm going to um, I'll open it up. Benedict? Um, sure, I think that's a, it's a very important question. I think it's uh, broader than, 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 than smart contract, and it, uh, you know, it directs to the transfer of digital assets um, on, on distributed ledgers. Um, and I think we've, in, in, in the public discussion, we focused so much about uh, regulatory implications of um, ICOs mostly and, and investor, in, uh, investor protection and consumer protection implications. Um, so I'm not going to talk about what uh, regulations already exist that, that are considered to be applying to these um, circumstances, but rather which, which ones um, don't exist yet. And I think in the previous panel, the ESMA panelist already alluded to that. 
I think there are huge regulatory vacuums uh, in terms of uh, secondary markets. Um, and when we look at many cryptocurrency or crypto assets that have been issued and are traded on a daily basis, I mean, um, still today, coin market cap shows a daily trading volume of 12 billion. And I know that's not a lot in, in relation to traditional financial markets, but it's still a considerable amount. And many of these are traded on unregulated exchanges, some of them in Europe. And so based on the assumption that these are not financial instruments. And what we don't see, and I think which is a big black box, is um, market abuse on these exchanges. So not only concerning primary market or the regulations of these exchanges themselves, but actually the market abuse that happens um, and seems to be quite common um, and even you know quite a, an inherent um, method of some some uh, secondary market activities, whether it's front running, insider training, etc. And I think there, that's a big gap. Um, and on the other hand, also an aspect which hasn't gotten uh, widespread attention, in my opinion, is the civil private law treatment of the legal concepts um, of the token, for example. Um, coming from Switzerland, uh, FINMA stated in, in 2018 that uh, many ICOs and tokens that were sold there under um, constitute uncertificated securities. Um, so they could bring it within the purview of, of FINMA. Um, what they didn't really look at was the implications that would have from, from a civil private law perspective because uncertificated securities can only be um, transferred either by assignment, which needs written form, session of rights, um, or by uh, intermediated securities, which needs regulated intermediaries such as banks um, and, and um, securities uh, dealers, etc. And so what effectually happened is that most tokens that changed um, positions from one owner to another didn't legally and validly um, transfer the, the rights that were um, included in these tokens. So if you talk about somebody did an ICO and conferred voting rights or um, profit sharing rights to the investors, um, they cannot legally transfer these tokens as of today. And so from a delegate Ferenda perspective, I think we need a new private law concept of the token um, because it, it emulates bearer instruments very much without having the legal recognition of being a bearer instrument. So I think this is, I think, one of the most important discussions going on right now. Uh, Liechtenstein has just proposed their new blockchain law, which actually did include a private law treatment of the concept of a token. And um, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to see where this discussion is going, um, also in, on a European level, because I know there are also differences in the private law treatment of tokens in uh, many European member states. Thank you. Would another panelist like to respond? If I, if I can add to that, I think that um, uh, if we stay to the concept of um, technology neutrality, um, in the end, I mean, the token is really just like a number on a smart contract. So the question is, uh, what, what does it mean to actually look at the token and try to understand what it is and therefore how to regulate it as opposed to the same the same number, the same topic, token can be used at the same time as a means of payment, as um, a privilege, as a government structure, um, potentially as a security if it is uh, used as an investment contract and so forth, or as an asset-backed uh, token and so forth. And um, I think it's really, the problem is that the usage is changes. So you can have the same token that is used by one person as something and then by another person as something. And then a third party can then all of a sudden say that I might accept this token as a way to access my service and then giving yet another usage to this, uh, to this same token. And, um, and another thing that I think is really interesting in terms of um, uh, how do we actually interpret them under the, under the law is like this new uh, trend of using the token as a collectible, uh, where the token is actually the value per se is to actually hold the token and then 
to which extent can we qualify this? Like, what kind of legal qualification does it fall into, and so far? Thank you. We get one more response. Yeah, maybe to add, um, if you look at um, the question, who actually regulates, especially those questions, how to in rem transfer assets from one party to the other, that goes to the core of the national legislation that is typically had not been part of the European legislation. And that obviously triggers um, specific challenges in the context of um, tokens, which do not recognize any physical boundaries. Um, so that, that's a huge question. Um, for example, if you look at receivables, receivables typically remain um, within their jurisdiction where they have been created. So the question of how they are transferred will always go back to their roots. And that's completely different for physical assets that you can hold in, in your hand and, and grab because they um, are always transferred according to the jurisdiction where they are at that point in time physically located. And so those rules um, really create problems when you talk about you know, some tokenization of, of assets. And I think there is no true perfect solution to those problems currently. Thank you. And for our next question, Panelists, is there a need for specific rules regarding the legal recognition of smart contracts in contrast to other software? And I'll open it up to the panelists to respond. Well, we, we have clients <laughs> who actually uh, raised the questions um, that are they raised the need that they would like to see certain smart contracts being treated as separate um, legal entities. Um, if you think about, I don't know, custody cases where, uh, or where you send tokens into a smart contract, they get blocked for the given purpose, and after some triggers on that, uh, they are released somewhere else. Um, so typically the coders who come to us have the idea that while the token is sitting and blocked in the smart contract, it's not owned by either party. But that's actually not the legal reality because it only goes from one balance sheet to another balance sheet, which always must be tied to some legal entity, and that smart contract simply has no legal entity. Um, and so there, there is some conflict in the current legal system of how we treat these things compared to the ideas out in the coder world. Um, so yeah, that will actually need some further thought. Thank you. Yeah, I think it all depends on um, like what is the distinction between a smart contract and a traditional software. And uh, essentially, when I interact with uh, software code on the internet, the software is really just the medium by which I'm actually interacting with an, an actual legal entity on the other side. So there is like this concept of agency. Uh, when I actually interact with a smart contract, the smart contract depends because in some cases the smart contract is actually controlled by a particular actor and is actually in the same way as I interact with a particular platform online, I can interact with a smart contract. The, the distinction comes when you actually have an autonomous smart contract that is actually only controlled and regulated by the actual code um, that has been put on the blockchain. Uh, especially even when the smart contract itself is just a medium between two parties, but then we have the problem of the pseudonymity. So we are entering into a contract, we, are we really entering a contract with the actual smart contract or with the party that itself is interacting through the smart contract, but I don't really know what, what the identity of the, of the counterparty is. Um, and this is, this is actually, uh, this, this causes a lot of problem, especially like in, in terms of giving uh, the, the distinction between what happened within the technical world and what happened into the legal world, and this is, uh, this, is, um, uh, this is actually a work that we are uh, focusing now um, a lot with, within the call organization, which is um, there are things happening into the technical world. For instance, I'm transferring funds to a smart contract, but the legal world does not perceive this as uh, as this, so it creates a discrepancy between what the legal world can see or can understand and then what the technical world actually is because my funds are actually there and I don't control them anymore and only the, the technical code controls them. And so 
there is this need of actually providing an interface between what is actually happening de facto into the technical framework of a blockchain system and what actually happens legally. Right? And uh, we, are, we, are, we are really lacking this interface at the moment and we need to figure out what are the different ways in which we can accommodate so that as to realign what is happening in the technical and in the legal system. Thank you. Robert? Um, yeah, it was interesting to have uh, Prandera talk about the interface. I mean, it's obviously something I raised in, in the report that Ludovic um, uh, kindly uh, shared to everyone prior to this particular meeting. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, one of, I mean, it's almost a question that I come back to um, often relates to the, the notion of, of the benefit of, of contracting in, in an autonomous way where, where the, the human element or the agency, if you want to put it in those terms, seems to be um, abdicated or removed in some sense. I mean, obviously, we're talking about specifically what area of contract uh, are we really focusing on here? Because obviously, in certain you know, financial sectors, whether it's um, securities, derivatives, trading, whatever it might be, there is certainly going to be much stronger arguments for um, having a, a form of sort of executable contract which can happen autonomously, but perhaps not necessarily so in consumer contract environments where the, the removal of, of a level of agency becomes far more problematic uh, to my mind. So I think the, it's, it's not a uniform issue quite quite simply um, I mean I, you know that's stating the obvious in many respects but um, the broad range of, of, of kind of contracts here it, it seems to me that all too often um, they seem to be captured uh, under a, sort of a, a singular notion or rather blockchain becomes a sort of a, a, a leveling of, of really what contracts ought to be doing when in actuality we know from hundreds of years of experience just how varied contract law is and the purposes for which it has evolved to um, deal with uh, sort of heterogeneity <coughs> and contingency across a whole wide range of, of human enterprise. Um, and so my question really that I come back to there is, is, is does, does blockchain as a technology really just flatten everything out, maybe too much? If I can add, uh, I also think it's a relevant question to, uh, relevant, well, it's a question actually to the question of Peter about uh, uh, Article 22 um, and whether uh, a smart contract is actually creating issues with the GDPR. And I think um, it's, it's actually, it boils down to the question of whether or not we can regard this smart contract as a contract uh, in the sense that the Article 22 says that, well, it is, uh, the paragraph does not apply if it's actually necessary for entering into an actual contract. So if we see a smart contract as a pure autonomous algorithmical thing, then perhaps it is a question. Uh, but if we recognize this, that it is actually a necessary means to actually fulfill a contractual obligation, then it, it doesn't cause the same kind of problem. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, just to quickly come back on that, I mean, is there therefore a distinction between the legal effects produced by a particular software executing versus the actual contained notion of contract as an existing and long-standing traditional body of law? Um, I think those are two, two separate sort of issues. Thank you, panelists. Um, for our next question, this is interesting. What use cases for smart contracts could be unfolded with a clear legal framework? Who would like to jump in on that one? <laughs> Putting you on the spot to think of use cases. <laughs> um, maybe I'd like to say something which also reflects back to the, the, the former question. And, and I think personally that we don't need a new legal framework specifically for smart contracts. Uh, because in my opinion, smart contracts themselves they might be a vehicle or a substrate which manifests the meeting of the mind as any other vehicle or substrate that can be, whether it's paper form, etc. If, if no written form is required and the law does not provide for any other uh, formal requirements, you know, a smart contract, in my opinion, can certainly be a manifestation of, of the meeting of the minds that happened um, outside of it. And so... If there's written form, we, we can't just 
if there's written form requirement, we can just treat it like other digital contracts and using qualified electronic signature. Um, and so I think the, as to this question specifically, the, the constraints as for use cases of legally binding smart contracts don't necessarily come from the law, but rather from the technology itself, because there are many constraints to the usability of, of, of smart contracts. Um, and also how they often not reflect um, economic nature, um, because they are very in inefficient for um, locking up capital and you need working capital and uh, the smart contract if it's uh, constructed as an escrow by definition locks up capital for a long time so there's a, a big question mark regarding um, scalability of that um, in, in, in the business um, application I think. Thank you. Would anyone else like to answer on use, on use cases? Can I just follow up on, on Yes, please do. Um, yeah, no, I think this, again, this, this kind of comes back to the issue of, of sort of the legal effects produced. Um, so it's uh, as opposed to, to the actual uh, instrument itself. Now, yeah, the, the sort of almost what you defined there was a form of sort of customary or conventional kind of development of law that sort of occurs on the peripheries, on the margins of formal codified law or settled jurisprudence in, in some form or another. Um, and I think, again, this, this is nothing new. Um, you know, we've, the, the law uh, has been able to do, adapt to these things very well for a very long time. Um, so, yeah, it, in respect of, of the need for sort of specific legal frameworks for, for smart contracts, I think um, it is sort of problematic to go too far down the road of seeing them as, as, dis, as sort of discrete, highly unique sort of entities when in actuality they do dissolve into existing legal frameworks. Um, and my approach to this has always been based on, I mean, the, sort of the notion of, of the conduct which is kind of produced by this. Um, uh, there's been some, uh, an, an interesting paper on smart contracts, uh, blockchain, blockchain is a form of, of legal sort of engineering, uh, which is done by uh, Goldfein and, and Leiter, uh, which I would sort of uh, recommend people look at as well. Because again, it is this idea that things are fed in, but it produces a certain conduct. Smart contracts produce a certain contact, conduct, but that exists and can be within the cognizance of law, as we find it with common or civil law jurisdictions. Thank you. Um, I think uh, maybe I, I fully agree with uh, Benedict that I think that when we talk about smart contract, we're really talking about the technical feasibility of actually enforcing an agreement. Um, but if we want to actually expand the use case into like the more uh, real world application, like interaction with the actual physical world, whether it's because I'm selling an actual physical assets and whatnot, um, it's not really about whether the smart contract is a legally recognizable, enforceable contract. It's more about uh, can I figure out ways to create like some more hybrid of a contract that include also a legal contract because there is a lot of things that actually come into play that will never be incorporated into the actual code of the smart contract. So the smart contract will execute as, as written, but then all the other things that are part of like the actual traditional uh, contractual relationship <coughs> needs also to be accounted for. So I think as we want to expand the use cases beyond the actual blockchain-based interactions, um, it's important to figure out ways in which we can mix and hybrid uh, legal contract and smart contract. And I think there is a lot of very interesting initiatives. There is open law uh, from consensus, like some also working on similar things. So uh, trying to figure out, not just like benefiting from the best of both worlds, having like the smart contract for everything that can be codified and that can be automated, and then having an actual legal contract which relates to all the things that happen outside of the chain. Excellent. Thank you, Primavera. Um, our next question is a little bit different. Are there frictions between existing regulations, such as GDPR and MIFID2, and legal recognition of effects of smart contracts? And if so, how could they be resolved? Um, Michelle, did you want to? Uh, I, I can definitely take the GDPR part. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to take the MIFID part, though. Um, 
So I think if you look at the interaction between smart contracts and the GDPR, there's many, many interesting issues, but maybe something to focus on, which was mentioned already, is Article 22, which I think is definitely, in my mind, the most interesting provision when it comes to um, smart contracts, which haven't really gotten a lot of attention yet. Um, so maybe, Michelle, would you be able to say? Yeah, I'm just going to, okay. like, so to make, so, so maybe to, to tell you a bit what Article 22 uh, mm -hmm. GDPR is about for those that know, don't know about it. So, Article um, 22 sets out a qualified prohibition of solely automated data processing. Um, and essentially, if you look at the structure, the first paragraph says that um, in the EU, individuals should not be subjected to um, solely automated decisions. Um, and if you look at the regulatory guidance that has already been issued on this, particularly the opinion of the Article 29 Working Party, which used to be the sort of entity in charge of uh, providing guidance on the interpretation of the GDPR in Europe, um, it's quite clear that smart contracts will fall under this qualified prohibition. Now, it's a qualified prohibition, so it doesn't mean that you can't ever have solely automated data processing in the EU, such as when using a smart contract. Um, but you will need to comply with some requirements. So paragraph two of article 22 tells you that there's three grounds on which you can nonetheless proceed with um, solely automated data processing. The first one, which was already mentioned, um, is where there is a contract, but this isn't, I think this isn't quite as easy as, as, as you would think to the extent that this contract needs to be, it's not sufficient for it to be part of a contract. It needs to be a contract between the data subject and the data controller. And in most circumstances where smart contracts are used, um, the sort of counterparty to, to the smart contract won't be the data controller of the personal um, data in question. So this doesn't actually get you out of having to comply um, um, with the requirement, especially since the requirements in paragraph three, which I'll uh, talk about in a minute, will, will nonetheless apply. <coughs> Um, the second ground where you can still rely on forms of automated, solely automated data processing is where there's EU member state law that explicitly allow you to do so, and this is something um, that hasn't been done yet specifically in relation to smart contracts as, as we talk about them today. Um, and then you can also do it where the data subject provide explicit consent, which again is something that you can do in some scenarios, but generally providing consent on the GDPR is something that's quite difficult from a legal perspective. Um, now, where you have a form of solely automated data processing, such as a small contract that falls under one of those three grounds, such as where it's part of a contract, you can proceed with the um, solely automated data processing, but only where you comply with certain safeguards. Um, which include the duties to inform the data subject about the automated processing that's, that's taking place, but also a duty to have an option of human intervention. Right? So Article 22 tells you you can do those kinds of data processing, but only where a human is in the loop and the human's involvement needs to be more than purely nominal. So it's not enough to have a human at the end of the, end of the process who can solely sort of uh, rubber stamp the decision that has been, that has been reached. Um, and I think that if you look at the setup of this provision, it's definitely fair to say that this is something that causes friction when it comes to smart contract. I think it's a sort of legal obligation resting on people using smart contracts. It hasn't really given <coughs> lots of um, thought to up until, up until today. But it's also something that people are already addressing without really realizing that they're doing so. So if you look at uh, projects that involve smart contract arbitration mechanisms, for instance, I think there's an argument to be made that maybe those arbitration um, um, sort of add-ons to the smart contracts might qualify as form of, view, of human intervention that, that might allow you to comply with Article 22, even though you're, you're using a smart contract. Nina, thank you, Michelle. Yeah, uh, I, I guess I would be the typical one for MIFID, but uh, <laughs> I think we heard about, um, you know, the financial regulatory um, topics already a lot in the prior panel. So I would like um, to highlight that we also have in the uh, pure consumer protection related regulation also some hurdles. Um, there are revocation rights um, that uh, to some extent there is the requirement to provide an order in writing or to confirm it by sending a PDF and stuff like that, which doesn't really fit to the blockchain environment. Um, so I guess um, there is a lot of regulation also in the private law, um, which is 
uh, written and designed with having the pure internet-based business models in mind, and which do not really fit to the new technology base um, that is coming up. And um, yeah, actually, I need to run in five minutes, so please excuse, I'm creeping out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your contribution. <laughs> Um, for our next question, panelists, in case of smart contract failure or unforeseen execution, how are the liabilities distributed? And is there a need for clarification on this? So who is the brave? Robert, you're thinking about it. <laughs> Person responding. Um, well, I mean, I, I think this goes back to, to uh, some of the questions well, the content of some of the questions we've, we've already addressed. I mean, I, uh, I'm not necessarily going to, to throw myself in the deep end here and, and, and try and work through uh, a, a variety of, uh, of different sort of outcomes. Um, but I think, I mean, again, this, this sort of comes back to really how smart contracts uh, are, are kind of construed uh, in, in legal terms. I mean, because if they are construed as contracts, then the liabilities um, are going to be distributed you know, in many respects, uh, with respect to the full manifest of, of and, and the various sort of remedial outcomes of, of existing private contract law. Um, the, I, I mean, again, um, and, and what, you know, this has already been raised, the, the, the difficulty comes where we're dealing with smart contracts which are happening invisibly, perhaps uh, autonomously behind the scenes and machine to machine processes, um, where the sort of the, the nature and, and perhaps even the motivation of the transaction every moment in time can be brought into question in, in uh, at a point of of, of, um, of litigation. Um, I mean, I think as, as a, a sort of a horribly broad response. I mean, I think there's something to be said here for for really whether um, uh, you know the notion of liability and the extension of uh, the process of litigation are actually going to be mitigated by smart contracts. From most of what I've heard in the work I've been doing in the UK Parliament, uh, sort of arena, uh, and, and elsewhere, the, the consensus has been no. Um, so in that sense, litigation is not going anywhere. There is going to be a necessity to find a way to, to distribute uh, liabilities. Um, but that has to be done on, on, sort of the, on the nature of, of the particular uh, uh, contract which is, which is executing, because are we talking about invisible smart contracts? Or are we talking about ones which are, are sort of um, are more obvious? Michelle? Maybe yeah, maybe just to add to that, I mean the the requirements of Article Twenty Two GDPR might actually be quite helpful in this in this regard to the extent that you know where you do have the human in the loop because it's something that Article Twenty Two uh, requires you to have, then they might actually. Um, to be able to provide mechanisms to deal with those unforeseen con so, um, sort of consequences of, of a smart contract um, execution. Thank you. Prima Vera? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, again, it depends on what do we mean by uh, the failure of a smart contract. I interpret it as being like uh, an actual bug. The, the, the smart contract is actually flawed. Um, and I think in some way it's it's not that different as to when we have a product which is uh, so defective um, and we have like some mechanism of, for instance of certification uh, so can the developer of a smart contract be held to be liable if the smart contract is actually flawed um, well perhaps it depends on whether or not there has been an auditing and a certification and if the contract is actually certified to be correct but then there is a completely unexpected bug then perhaps the developer should not be held liable because it, it just like the manufacturer of a car that gets certified in the production will not be liable for every accident or, or, or problem that happens afterwards. And then on the other side, what happens if there is indeed still a problem because the, the smart contract fails even though it has been certified, or perhaps even if it has not been certified, can we, can we consider that the user might then be uh, just having to pay the expenses because it has interacted with a smart contract that was not audited and was not certified. Um, and I think in, in, in this context, in the same way as we do in the real world with, with dangerous projects like cars, um, I think we can, we, can, we can imagine mechanism of insurance. 
uh, in the sense that we, 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 by interacting with this particular uh, technical thing, then we know that there is always a risk that something might go wrong. Um, and I think an, an interesting aspect will be indeed that the, the auditor should also perhaps play the, the role of the insurer in the sense that if, if I audit a particular smart contract, then perhaps I should also be responsible for compensating people that actually might interact with the smart contract and actually it turns out that it was not properly audited. So I think we can actually come up with mechanisms by looking at examples in the real world of how do we actually deal with risk when those risks might be beyond the scope of the control of the, of the party that are actually producing the smart contract and try to come up with ideas as to how we can mitigate this risk. Interesting, thank you. Robert, you have something? Oh, I, again, I just wanted to follow up very briefly. I mean, I think, again, this, um, this reflects greatly on, on, on uh, a lot of what um, I've been seeing and reading recently, which is um, something which actually kind of goes to the challenge of, of, of the, 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 sort of the idealistic benefits uh, of this technology in the first place, that we are actually just seeing a rather rapid creep back in of, of third-party mediatory <laughs> forms. I mean, the, the, the whole idea of you know, the, the, the sort of the libertarian Bitcoin uh, uh, blockchain, if we want to take it to sort of that kind of particular ideal. Um, and uh, uh, certainly of open blockchain is, is, is rapidly breaking down, um, whether it's custodians in terms of sort of securities trading, bonds issuance, um, or whether it's um, auditors, um, either of the systems or of the content. Um, it, and or whether it's going to be insurance, which is going to come in to wrap around all of this. Um, notwithstanding, there are, again, there are other sort of legal mechanisms um, which are always already acting around sort of contract, whether it sort of be kind of trusts and, and various other mechanisms such as that, um, which are going to be sort of scaffolding uh, these sorts of problems and helping to already allocate liabilities. Thank you. I'll give you a yeah, uh, yeah, Sure, um, I think it's a, it's a very important point, point you made. Um, and I think we've seen that uh, the instantiation of, of the DAO hack um, and the remedies that were taken and the legal questions that were um, posited there, whether in fact, uh, you know, they... Um, do you want to explain what, two uh, sentences on what a DAO is? So the, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization and its first uh, famous instantiation um, was hacked in 2016 and there's a lot of contention about whether it was actually a hack, I don't think it was. Um, but anyway, a lot of value got lost and a lot of people, um, in the end not, but then, um, and the Ethereum blockchain fork. But we're going to, I think, talk about that more in, in the latter question. What I wanted to talk about was that this showed um, the legal system wants accountability and wants accountability of legal entities whose assets it, it can seize and whereupon it can enforce um, obligations. Mm -hmm. And so whether or not you, you want that to happen in, 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 in relation to smart contracts, um, there is this pressure from the legal system to nonetheless do that because the legal system is conceptualized as to not allow a legal vacuum. And um, so it will pierce the corporate, you know, the corporate, the, the technological veil, um, to, to use this uh, comparison. Um, but then I think there are so many practical um, limitations in, in actually allocating liability, just based on the fact that this multitude of, of parties are involved in the creation and the execution of the smart contracts, uh, whether it's it's miners, validators, and often on a on a cross border multinational um, level, and oftentimes parties are not identifiable, and um, so even if you wanted to, the we're talking about you know allocation of liability, I think the practical implications uh, mean that oftentimes it's it's by the normative power of the de facto, not possible to allocate liability. And so it's in the interest of everybody, in, I think, participating in this um, ecosystem to find solutions. And, and that goes back to the question we discussed 
um, of, of smart contracts and, and DAOs creating legal effects or appointing people who or some legal entities with legal capacity as being um, accountable for, for what happens. And, and currently, I think it's, this still is a big, big vacuum. Thank you. I'm going to move on to the next question. Okay, so this is kind of a long question. So <laughs> combine a question. So we should get your thinking heads up. Um, so the question is definitely related to the DAO uh, that you just, or two DAOs that you just spoke about. Um, do the complex governance structures created through smart contracts, su such as DAOs, create specific legal recognition and liability issues. And therefore, would it make sense to create a specific legal personality to govern these type of structures? And then following that, does the multinational nature, which you mentioned, Benedict, of these structures make it a good use case for EU harmonization? <laughs> So, I can start. Does, do the DAOs create the specific um, legal recognition liability issues? Would it make sense to create a specific legal structure? And does the multinational nature of these structures make it a good case for EU harmonization? Yeah, I'm going to take one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I think that, I mean, the multinational uh, sort of nature which you know, by extension means multi-jurisdictional nature of those things is something that I find extremely fascinating. Um, and what's so difficult about it is that it's not limited to the EU context, right? So of course, if you had a, had a DAO that, that was multinational and does multi-jurisdictional between the various member states of the EU, that would be like a textbook case of uh, the need for EU harmonization and um, you know, it'd be quite clear what the, what the benefits thereof would be. The real challenge is that the jurisdictions involved, or presumably involved, because we often don't know um, sort of where, where the various uh, pseudonymous participants in a, in a DAO uh, are located, is that presumably at least they're located in jurisdictions that are also outside of the EU. So um, that doesn't mean that there's no use to harmonization in the EU context, but the effects thereof will be limit, limited and probably require some sort of additional uh, coordination effects to account for the at least in some cases, like generally global nature of those of those artifacts. Thank you, Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna take another piece of the question. Um, I think the question as to like if there a need for having some kind of legal recognition for uh, a DAO. Um, I think it, it's important to distinguish between when we have a DAO, which is an actual decentralized autonomous organization, which means that it actually operates independently of like any single uh, control, and, uh, and more of a blockchain-mediated organization, which is actually just representing an actual organization of people that are mediating their interaction through a DAO. And I think in the later case, it it might make sense to recognize it in, in, in many ways it is already some form of general partnership or it already exists de facto as some form of organization so it might make sense to provide some uh, explicit legal recognition and I think this is what uh, Malta is, is doing. Uh, when we move into the DAO in the more traditional sense of the terms in which we don't actually have one central entity that control it or like one one board of directors that actually have power of the of the operation of this DAO. I think it's actually interesting perhaps to think not necessarily in as the DAO as this kind of monolithic entity that then can be recognized as a legal person, but perhaps to look more at what do we actually need to implement in order to enable interactions with this DAO. Like, um, and I think data was an, an example in the sense that what if a commercial company like Lockheed wants to receive money from a DAO, um, but of course <coughs> needing to justify where does the money come from. And, um, and so one solution that had been identified was to create an additional company, which was DAOLINK, that will actually act as the gateway between this technical thing that is actually not recognized by the legal system and 
the actual legal company of Lockheed. Um, and it was possible because of particular settings of Swiss law that were actually enabled for money to be collected by Dowling and then transferred back to Lockheed, even if they didn't know exactly where the money came from. And so I think it's interesting as we as we as we start thinking about DAOs and what kind of functions they can have and to look at what are the specific interface that need to be designed. Uh, for instance, what, what happens if I do want a DAO to hold property, to own property beyond digital assets? Um, what kind of legal construction do I need to create around this without just looking at the DAO as this one thing, but just what are the various gateways? And the same gateway can interact with a variety of DAOs. So in the case of Dowlink, it was specifically designed for one, but the legal construction was an actual gateway for contractualizing and for, and for receiving money from any possible kinds of DAO. And I think in this case, if we go back to the harmonization, it's, uh, it's actually important to think about harmonization in terms of um, if I want to interact with a DAO from a particular country, I will probably need to find this gateway that is specific to this jurisdiction because that's that's a jurisdiction that actually enables it. And um, so Switzerland seems to have uh, some favorable uh, regulatory framework. Perhaps Malta will also uh, have one of those. And I think it's interesting to think not necessarily as to how do we assign legal personality to a DAO because we don't really uh, understand what does it mean at the moment, but it's more about those DAO are operating. And if we want to interface with legal entities companies and corporations or organizations, then we need to create those small uh, FPV that are specifically designed in order to facilitate the interaction between those two, the technical framework and the legal framework. Thank you. Oh, we have time for a brief... Yep, yeah, go ahead. Maybe uh, I, I can add to this. I, I, I agree with uh, this, this proposition that um, for, from a pragmatic and practical point of view, we we need to create such um, such APIs as, as Primavera calls them between the DAO world and and the legal world in order to allow DAOs to create legal effect in, in the legal world and 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 vice versa um, because as a fact of the matter these organizations are operative and they are transferring a lot of value um, between different entities and so. We need to, I think, clean up, start cleaning up the mess and also prevent further mess from happening. Um, for the long term, however, I don't think that this will uh, turn out to be a viable solution. And the more autonomous these organizations grow, um, the more agency um, they will be endowed with or endowed themselves with. Um, I think just creating SPVs will fall short. and. Uh, these organizations will challenge the very notion of, of personhood, which in the history of law has been challenged several times. And it was not very long ago until we first re you know, recognized non-human um, entities as being endowed with uh, legal personhood. And in some distant future, we, we might have to ask that question again and, and, and see whether we have to um, also endow digital entities with a certain... Um, a certain degree of, of autonomy to be considered um, persons, at least from, from a legal perspective as well. Thank you, very interesting. And now I'd like to open up the discussion for questions. Um, yes, um, bringing you the microphone in just a moment. <coughs> Thank you, Ludovic. Yeah. <coughs> it's you. Oh, cool. Uh, I've got a very, very quick question and then a slightly more uh, longer one. Uh, the quick question is in um, Article 22, Paragraph 2.C, where it says, uh, unless uh, consent has been explicitly given, out of curiosity, can that consent then be withdrawn <coughs> by those that gave it? Because that adds another layer of complexity to that one. Um, and the second one, which is more on the discussion just at the end there, talking about digital um, uh, giving legal personality to digital entities. Uh, it, it's certainly a complex uh, web that, that, that we weave there. And when you've got, and certainly in our case as well, when you're 
creating digital entities and then minting each other and creating each other, all of which have a number of on-ledger computing um, and potentially a whole batch of smart contracts uh, associated with them, at what point do we separate them legally rather than saying, well, the person that originally wrote the code that enabled this has suddenly got some kind of liability? Because that doesn't seem particularly fair um, that as a software engineer you might accidentally put in, 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 uh, in train a set of events that means that somebody comes knocking on your door. So it was interesting that you mentioned that right at the end because uh, I think that's going to be a big issue and I'm kind of curious as whether or not you've got anything more to add on that because with autonomous um, digital agents or digital entities running around on the network doing stuff on behalf of people, things, data, hardware or whatever, that's going to become a very big issue very, very quickly. I mean, it's a complex web we weave here, um, for sure. Michelle, did you want to answer the first question? Sure. Uh, yeah, the quick answer is yes, right? Um, and as I assume you know, you, you were alluding to, this is something that creates problems in relation to smart contracts specifically, because if you can't halt the execution, then, then that's problematic. And I think more generally, it draws attention to the fact that, you know, at least if you, if you sort of read the media, consent is sort of presented as like the ground of like lawful personal data processing that everyone is and should be relying to, but it's actually, I think, the weakest of, of, of all of the links for this reason and particularly problematic in, in the context of automated uh, data execution. Yeah, because technologically that's a real bind when you've got stuff on a permanent global ledger and global state, it's really difficult to, so there's a technological issue behind that as well, so thanks. Okay, and uh, Benedict, were you going to answer the second? Sure, please. Um, so, um, I, I think it would be would be foolish, given the Im implications, that introducing a new non-human entity as uh, as a legal person um, to do that right away, um, because as you say, it's such a intricate, interdependent. Um, complex set of relations uh, that that uh, come into existence uh, with with smart contracts and, and DAOs and so many actors um, that are part to that. So if, and I think we will have to do that in some time, but we would have to start doing the work now of mapping these, these different relations and the implications thereof. Um, and in, in the mean term, I think, uh, you know, just as a matter of a practical perspective, what we want to prevent is what legal commentators have um, proposed in, in, um, in amidst the DAO hack is that every participant, even some consumers, um, unknowingly would have become part of this general partnership, creating joint and several liability. Um, or the you know coder who's an open source believer just puts up a code and then gets uh, at some point um, sued or held liable for um, all the ensuing um, transactions that happened and potential damage that happened. So I think that's something we want to prevent. And in the midterm, creating such SPVs, I think, is a viable solution. But, uh, yeah. Thank yeah, you. Uh, oh, oh, can I have to move on to the next? Yes, you may. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think you can... You, so there are many reasons why you might think about providing legal personality, legal capacity to to a DAO, um, and one of them is obviously limited liability. Uh, the other one is providing legal capacity, the capacity to own assets and the capacity to enter into contractual relationships. And um, I think the question as to whether or not we want limited liability is something that needs to be discussed. We need to figure out to which extent we want limited liability, in which context, like what are the preconditions, just like when we create a company, there are different types of companies, some of them have a limited liability, some of them less so. Uh, but with regard to actual legal capacity, I think there is these interesting things in which de facto those those entities can hold assets and can enter into smart contract rela relationship already. So they already have some form of technical capacity, but the problem is that this technical capacity does not map immediately back to some legal capacity. And that's where I think there is some, there is some need to creating an interface or bringing back this technical capacity with a legal capacity. As in, if I enter into, if I, if I transfer funds to a DAO, then there needs to be a way to actually say that the DAO holds and is now the, the legal owner of those funds. Or 
whatever else I, I want to assign to this DAO. So there is like there is a there is a distinction. The problem is that the the technical world is operating with this particular capacity of those entities to do things, but those things are things that usually uh, are only assigned to legal persons. And so we need to figure out ways, and I think with the SPV is one particular way to actually achieve that, and that's independent on, on whether or not we want to assign uh, limited liability to those to those entities as well. Yeah, I mean, it's just, very sorry, it's just when the digital entities start creating themselves, and one entity spawns other entities, and each of these has a unique um, identification that can hold assets, then it becomes very, very, very complicated. And as people have commented today, and sorry, and then I'll shut up, um, that this, these early days were smart contracts, right? It's like throwing rocks in the air and comparing it to the space shuttle. So we've got to be careful not to get too carried away at this and, stage. And you're welcome to continue during lunch, I, the, I the conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ludovic, do we have yeah. time for one more question? W one last question, and okay. this question was already Thank taken you. here, so. Thanks everybody for the really interesting discussion. Um, I have one technical clarification and then a couple of um, questions where I just would like to ask you to mention some of the things that you think are most interesting in the space for ways of, uh, of solving these problems. The first is um, uh, you mentioned the DAO, uh, Benedict, and, um, and Primavera, you mentioned um, the idea of, uh, of auditors carrying liability insurance. Um, in a situation like the DAO, though, it's difficult to know. I mean, the, the DAO, it turned out that the recursive call attack that was used there was actually a feature of Solidity itself. Uh, so, so there you could have audited the contract from the perspective just of the contract, but the underlying programming language um, had this feature or bug, I guess, in it as well. Um, so it's not just a question of auditing uh, your smart contract code, but also knowing what's going on in the underlying uh, programming language, which brings us back to sort of general liability me mechanisms for open source software development. Um, the two questions that I wanted to pose. Um, one is on transfer backs. So in a paper world of contracts, um, there is sometimes the option of engaging in self-help if something has been transferred um, uh, physically but not legally, um, and you can get the, the thing back. Sometimes you have to go to court to do it. Um, in the smart contract world, that's not possible because you don't hold the private key to actually transfer it back to yourself. So um, have you come across any interesting mechanisms for addressing this issue? as a second step um, post transfer of the property and then the the asset whatever it is and then the second question um is so one of the things that came out in in the report also by by robert is we have different types of contracts with different types of legal requirements for recognizing <coughs> their formal validity and this was mentioned in the private law context also by benedict needing to use bearer instruments and or regulated intermediaries for particular types of contracts. We have many other examples of that in the law where we have specific requirements for specific types of assets to be transferred. Um, is there a way of indexing what type of contract something is on a smart contract so that the proper formalities can then be somehow coded into the contract um, and indexed then to the authorities that, that need to be satisfied for that particular transfer? Thank you. Um, someone want to take the first or second question? We're running up against a time block, but we do have time for one of the questions. Um, I'll just say something very quickly, I guess, on, on, on the second point. I mean, I, 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 this interestingly sort of, again, sort of claws back um, the responsibility and the desire of the legal community to sort of remain uh, active um, because it, it sort of generates a whole uh, raft of possible work around uh, sort of contract coding um, that is not necessarily done um, uh, by people not within the legal community, uh, I, I suppose is, is sort of um, one kind of very quick response to that. But that in itself unravels into a whole world of other things, which um, I know that we're not really here to discuss today, but are, are kind of a, a point of interest um, for me personally, certainly teaching in, in a law school, is actually the, the role uh, this unravels into legal education itself and the development of sort of ongoing legal communities um, in, in relation to their responsibilities in, in sort of being able to uh, construct or, or, or draft contracts um, that might necessarily accord with traditional provisions but within a, in a small, smart contract. Thank uh, you. So. Um, so thank you for the other additional yeah. question and you're welcome to confer with the panelists at lunch. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's give our panelists a big hand. Thank you very much. Thanks.